We're in the middle of a sort of mini unit on goddesses. Last time we looked at Inanna and Dumuzi. This time we're taking a look at one of the best known and most widely distributed Egyptian myths of all time, Isis and Osiris. We've reached a point in the biography of the goddess at which in agricultural communities she's given up some of her power to a male consort whose job is to fertilize and the goddess and to assure a new cycle of growth. But in most of these myths, the consort then dies and is in some sense revived, if not always quite literally. Anyway, the myth is always associated with a cycle of vegetation and is still associated with the goddess. The dead god becomes simply the seed which is planted in the mother. Once again, we keep mentioning this book, and it probably is important that we all read it at some time or other, same James, Sir James Fraser as The Golden Bow. He suggested in his book the connection between this myth and the ritual in which a sacred king or surrogate would be sacrificed to assure renewed fertility. He mentions a lot of myths, and there are lots of others that you probably know about that stand behind this ritual. Demutsi, we looked at in the last lecture, Adonis, Attis, Dionysus, the Hittite Talipanu, and a number of consorts of the Semitic version of Inanna, Ishtar, Ashtoreth, Anat, Astarte, um, plus, of course, Demeter and Persephone, which makes some gender adjustments but keeps the basic pattern intact, and, of course, the one we'll look at today, Isis and Osiris. The background of the Isis-Osiris uh, myth was laid out in Lecture 3. Um, as we remember from then, Atum masturbates or expectorates Shu and Tefnut, the god of air and the goddess of moisture in the air, something like that, um, and they in turn beget Geb and Nut, the earth and the sky. Nut becomes the mother of Osiris, Isis, Seth, and Nephthys, two male-female pairs. When Osiris and Isis become the parents of Horus, that, those nine gods make up the Ennead. Uh, the, the, the closest thing we have to a sort of standard version of theology and mythology in Egypt. The most complete version of the Isis and Osiris story comes actually from Plutarch, a Roman writer of the first century CE. It seems odd to us that in thousands of years no one in Egypt bothered to write down the most popular myth of all times. But it's possible that because it was so well known, there was never any need to write it down. It's alluded to in hundreds of places, and so everyone seems to have known it, so why bother to write it out? Most of Plutarch's version can be verified by other references, so he seems to have gotten it right. As Plutarch tells the myth, Osiris and Isis had loved each other even while they were growing up in their mother's womb. Um, they grew up and they were married. Seth married Nephthys, his sister as well, but that marriage didn't turn out so happily as we'll see in just a little bit. Osiris as the firstborn became the first king of Egypt, and as the first king of Egypt he became a great culture hero. He taught people how to plant crops and how to harvest them and how to irrigate. He gave them a body of laws. Um, he taught them institutions. He taught them about the gods and how to respect them. And in a general sort of way, he raised them into a level of real civilization. Having gotten that far in Egypt, he then moves to other countries, attempting to do some of the same good works for them that he had done for Egypt. And while he is gone, he leaves Isis in charge of the kingdom. This would have been all right, except that his brother Seth has always seethed at his relative in consequence, and he has always planned in some way to depose Osiris and to seize the rule. Eventually, he comes up with a plan. He makes a beautiful box exactly to Osiris' size so that no one else would be able to fit into it. After a banquet one night, he brings out the box, which everyone admires, and says that whoever can fit exactly into it can have the box. When Osiris is in it, and of course it fits him perfectly, it was made for him, as soon as Osiris is in it, um, it's nailed shut and sealed with lead and suffocates Osiris. The box is then thrown into the Nile where it floats down to the delta and there lodges in a swamp. As soon as Isis finds out what's happened, she sets out in search of her husband's body. She finds it enclosed in a tamarisk tree which has grown up around it. And in fact, it got to be such a beautiful, huge, magnificent tree that had been cut down by the king of Byblos and used as a center post in his dining hall. The story here digresses off a little bit because 
ISIS herself digresses off. She takes a very unusual tack to get the body of her husband back. What she does is she disguises herself and goes to a well where women draw water. When the queen's handmaids come to draw water, she brushes their hair for them and in the process perfumes their hair with her own divine scent. When they return back to the palace, the queen is, notices there's something different about the, her handmaids and when they tell her, she sends them back out to find this really interesting stranger. They bring her back and the queen is so taken with her that she initially, immediately engages her as a nurse for her own infant son, which Isis does. But each night when she, when she has the child by herself, she pl very carefully places the child in the fire in a ritual that's designed to give him immortality. One night, however, the queen catches her doing this just as she's about to put the baby into the fire and she screams and demands the child back. It's interesting that this part of the story has an exact parallel in the story of Demeter at Eleusis. The same waiting at the well, the same handmaids, the same perfumed hair, the same engagement as a nurse, the same efforts to give the child immortality, the same discovery. It, we don't know quite why this is, but it may be that both Demeter and Isis were to become key figures in the mystery religions which swept across the Roman world. In both cults, one promise of becoming a member of the mystery cult was the hope of immortality, of a life after death. And that's interestingly the same that both of these goddesses had tried to give to their infant charges. The parallels are too precise to be coincidental, and we'll come back and look at a little bit this a little bit more later, particularly when we get to the story of Demeter and Persephone in Lecture 27. When she's caught putting the child in the fire and then and demanded to return the child, Isis then reveals herself and explains who she is to the queen. Um, she also explains that inside that huge tree which is used as a center post in the dining hall is the coffin containing the body of her husband. The queen helps her retrieve the coffin and when they get it out from the tree and open it, um, Isis delivers such a piercing cry that the little baby that she was taken care of, taking care of dies immediately. Then she takes the coffin back out to the delta, back out to the swamps, and there comes one of the most important and uh, oft-told parts of the story. She lies on top of the body of Osiris in the shape of either a hawk or a kite, lying on top of him, breathing into him, fluttering her wings, and in the process, regenerating him just sufficiently so that he can engender in her a child. That child will be Horus. That, that scene of the, of the hawk or the kite fluttering over the coffin of, of Osiris became one of the favorite subjects of Egyptian art. Then she gives birth to Horus in the swamps, and there are all kinds of ancillary stories about things that happen to the son each day while the mother has to go out looking for food for the two of them. One day he's actually killed by a scorpion, but fortunately um, his mother Isis has learned spells from the moon god, and she uses them to revive him. Seth is out, and then she hides the coffin in the, in the swamps in the delta. Seth is out boar hunting one night when he stumbles across Osiris's coffin, and which Isis has hidden. This time he decides he will make no mistakes about it, give her no chance to recover the body, so he cuts Osiris's body into 14 pieces and then scatters them up and down the Nile. Again, Isis goes in search of her husband's body. This time she's helped by her sister Nephthys, by Anubis, who is Nephthys' son, by Osiris, and by Thoth, the moon god. They find all the parts but the phallus, which a fish had already eaten, and in each place along the Nile where they find a piece of Osiris, they leave a memorial so that a dozen places in Egypt could claim down through history to be the burial place of Osiris. When they have all the parts, they, they make a replica for the one missing part, then they put him all back together again, and Anubis swathes the body in linen cloth and performs the rites that would later become the rites of the mummification process. Again, Isis fans Osiris with her wings, and this time she and Nephthys both sing spells over the corpse until it revives sufficiently 
that it can be sent by the gods so that Osiris can become king of the dead. Later he becomes the judge in the land of the dead and his job is to weigh the hearts of the deceased on the balance of justice to find out whether they would achieve a new life or be eaten by the underworld crocodiles and remain dead forever. Meanwhile, the Seth problem still goes on. It's just been inherited now by Horus, and Horus is now going to have to figure out some way of dealing with, uh, with this problem. The question is, who's going to be king of Egypt? Because Seth demands it um, as the brother, and Horus demands it as the son of Osiris. It's a, it's a really long and involved story. It's full of trials and hearings and behind-the-scenes machinations, and it winds up with a climactic three-day fight between Horus and Seth over deciding who gets to be king of Egypt. Seth it finally loses. Horus is declared the rightful king, the rightful heir, and hence the king of Egypt. In the uh, final battle that they fight, the, the two of them, they, they both... They, they both get damaged a little bit in the fight. Horus loses one eye, and according to the story, Seth loses one testicle in this, uh, in this battle. In the end, at the end of the story, when Horus brings the defeated Seth before his mother, brings him to Isis and says, Mother, what do I do with him? How do I dispose of him? She thinks about it for a while, and she says, Let him go. Release him. Turn him loose. Horus is so appalled at her decision and so angry with his mother that he immediately cuts her head off, which is later replaced, um, great, you know, it's replaced for her by Thoth, the moon god, who puts a cow's head in its place. Um, is, Hathor is an older Egyptian goddess who quite frequently appears with a, with a cow's head, and it may be that in acquiring her cow's head, in this particular time, what Isis is doing is simply absorbing some of the functions of the older goddess, but that's at any rate how she gets her cow's head. Our point here, anyway, is that what Isis does at this moment, when she says, let Seth go, is she understands that the continuation of creation depends on differentiation and opposition, which was a theme of our entire first course, first unit in this course. She could have had Seth destroyed, but then what? Half the friction that makes creation what it is would vanish. So she releases him, forever to be an enemy of civilization and culture, but without whom none of these things can ever have their meaning. We've already in this, quote, in this course quoted um, Jakob Behm, the 17th century German philosopher, who in, in speaking to this, is this issue says, the one as the yes is power and life and is the truth of God or God himself. He would be in himself unknowable and in him would be no joy of elevation nor feeling without the no. William Blake, uh, the 19th century mystic English poet um, in the 19th century would say something the same thing about th the need for this kind of conflict for creation to go on. As Blake puts it, one portion of being is the prolific the other, the devouring. The prolific would cease to be prolific unless the devourer, as the sea, received the excess of his delights. That is, there can't be yin without yang. There can be, can't be light without darkness. There can't be male without female. There can't be good without evil. Creation is a duality. We talked about this in our first unit. And the Egyptian mythmakers wrote this awareness into the mind of Isis. She turns Seth loose so that creation can continue. Horus is still very young and he believes in absolute, so he can't understand her gesture and he punishes her. He will, we think, in time come to understand the great duality of creation himself, the power of the negative, the power of the destroyer, but not yet, not in this myth. Well, that's our myth. That's, that's our story of, of Isis and Osiris with a little bit of, of Horus thrown in. What can we make of it? both for the Egyptians who created it and for ourselves as we ponder this very ancient tale. Well, the first thing we notice about it, it is very rich in metaphoric meaning. Essentially, it is a myth, which we're used to by now, a myth about a dying and rising god as a consort of the goddess who embodies the great creative power of the natural order. Osiris himself was a metaphor for the event in Egypt on which all life depended, the annual flooding of the Nile. Osiris himself was originally a fertility god, 
and his resurrection happened each year when the crops began to sprout after the inundation subsided. The annual flood itself was, of course, a kind of death of the cosmos, a return to the chaos of primeval waters, so that each year those new shoots arising out of the mud were a new creation, a new beginning. When Isis conceives a child from the dead Osiris, the act symbolizes in so many ways the new life that emerges out of death and stresses how important Isis is in this process. Horus is, of course, the reincarnation of Osiris. He is the new sprout that grows out of the death of his father. In terms of the, the vegetative myth, again, this was a, another way the Egyptians understood it, the dismemberment of Osiris by Seth, when, what is when Seth cuts Osiris into 14 pieces, came to represent the annual cutting down of wheat and barley, which looks like death, but which is also the basis for new life. And this, there, there were little refinements done with this part of the ritual. The animals most closely associated with Seth were the ox and the donkey, because they were both used to tread out the barley and wheat, and hence, if we think of the barley and wheat as the body of Osiris, these were the animals that tread on the body of Osiris. In some versions of the myths, Horus declares that forever and ever the ox and the donkey were always to be beaten as penalty for treading on the body of his father. So the myth explains the way the cosmos works for the Egyptians. Osiris comes to life in the rising Nile, sprouting grain, the waxing moon. He dies in the summer when the Nile falls, when grain withers, and he's overwhelmed by all that opposes good for human beings and civilization, represented by Seth. The rising Nile can also be the tears of Isis, weeping for her consort and providing the moisture for his parched body. She's manifest as the star Sothis, Sothis, for us, it's Sirius, it's the dog star. And that was important because the rising of Sothis in the east signaled the coming of the annual flood and brought Osiris back to life. Plutarch also says that Sothis in Egypt means pregnant. And if that's true, then Isis returns pregnant with Horus, the rebirth of Osiris and the new year, all of which coincides with the annual flood. He's the flooding of the Nile, and she's the earth that the flood covers. From that union, Horus is born, the child of both, and he is also the rebirth of Osiris, and he is also the life in, in the grain for the new year. That Isis and Nephthys work together to revive Osiris the second time is important, since together they represent the morning and the evening stars, the full and the dark moon. In Egyptian art, they are frequently pictured on the sarcophagi of the pharaohs, gently cradling them together into eternity. The myth for the Egyptians also justified the idea of divine kingship. Pharaoh was God, and that had been the case for a long time. Horus in this, in this myth makes clear how that works. When the pharaoh dies, he becomes Osiris. As Horus is Osiris reborn, so each new pharaoh is the last one reborn. Every pharaoh, living or dead, is a god. He is Osiris while he is alive, he is Horus after he dies. And the myth also finally provides a real, provided a real understanding for the Egyptian idea of what life after death amounts to. The Book of the Dead was an Egyptian collection of spells designed to help people make that journey from death to the next life, and it lays out the entire trip, including ways to negotiate the most difficult places along the way. Its purpose is to assure the same kind of immortality for other people that is always given to the Pharaoh because the Pharaoh is, of course, a god himself. The body has to be prepared in certain ways, and certain spells have to be spo spoken or sung to, or sent along with the deceased in order to assure a safe passage. Once the first stage is passed, the deceased joins the moon god, um, Thoth, as a star. The second stage gives a passage to the underworld palace of Osiris, and the third, if you successfully get past that one, allows him or her to accompany Ra in his boat as he sails through the sky each day. Osiris and Horus are important in this story because they're the ones who opened up those paths, who blazed the trail, and they became the models for all the rest of us dying human beings. 
what constitutes the proper preparation of the corpse, that's in the myth too, since the one who helps Isis and Nephthys in preparing the body of Osiris is Anubis, who's the child of Nephthys by Osiris. That, that's a, a, an ancillary part of the story, but according to the story, according to the myth, one night uh, when he came in in the dark, um, Osiris mistook Nephthys for Isis and conceived a child on her. Since relations were already strained with his brother, I'm sure that didn't help any. Anubis here uh, prepares the body and later becomes the embalmer god and the protector of graves. In fact, the whole idea of mummification is in this myth, in the procedures worked out to, to prepare Osiris for his resurrection and his installment as king of the dead. Anubis is one of those gods that we've mentioned earlier. He's part human, part animal. He's human with a jackal head. Back in lecture 12, we talked about this as a somewhat typical stage in the evolution of the human conception of God. Many modern people are slightly put off by those depictions, but there are some really good reasons why it, they should happen. And every half animal, half God, especially for the Egyptians, is based on a really close observance of the animal involved. Bering and Cashford, in a book that we've referred to before, The Myth of the Goddess, remind us that for the Egyptians, all animal life possesses religious significance. Every creature possesses some power, some part of divinity, some part of God that's, that dwells inside it. So there's, there is a divinity inherent in all creation. They also believed that while humans could change and did change via culture, that animals didn't. And so that animals in some way behaving the way they do always symbolize the original order of creation. So they observed animals very carefully and when they made a particular animal or bird or insect a part of a divine being, they did so with a real knowledge of that creature's attributes and skills. Isis herself appears as a kite, a hawk, a snake, a pig, and with a cow's head. Anubis has a jackal's head. And if we ask why a jackal, there turns out to be a really good reason for that. The answer is that the jackal lives on rotting flesh. It eats what not many animals can eat and survives on it, and it also recaptures flesh from about the furthest point from incarnation that it can be and redeems it back into the life cycle. So it takes putrid flesh and restores it, makes it nourishment for a living being. Um, in the Hall of the Dead, and what Anubis does is he adjusts the scales on which the heart is weighed, scales which decide whether a soul is worthy to enter the presence of Osiris. He's the judge because in eating, again, this is based on Egyptian observation, in, in eating, a jackal can decide which parts of, of the thing it's eating are usable and which aren't, which are good, which are bad, which are savable, which are not savable. And so to make him the, the operator of the scale, which decides what parts of the human being coming down are good and what are bad, makes a really perfectly good sense. The, the kite or hawk is a similar creature in that it too can eat things that most other creatures couldn't stomach um, and therefore again redeems that putrid flesh at the farthest end of incarnation and restores it, brings it back into the life cycle, which is exactly what Anubis helps to do in the Hall of the Dead. Um, there's also another myth about hawks and kites that it was believed in, in Egyptian mythology that when the beating of a hawk or kite's wings while it's holding its prey um, is in some ways the breath of life and that breath of life or it's like the breath of life anyway and that's the breath of life which Isis used when she flutters over the coffin of Osiris bringing him back up to life just enough that he can uh, engender Horus. But back to Isis. So to see if we can decide how she can help us to consolidate our understanding of the goddess and her dying consort, which is our, really our focus for these two lectures. The myth initially seems to be more about Osiris than it is about, about Isis. He's, after all, a fertility god himself. But after his death, he is essentially helpless and passive for the rest of the story. He needs to be rescued and revived twice by Isis, and his continued life in the Hall of the Dead is a gift from her. Um, earlier, uh, we mentioned that Plutarch says that the star which is one of her manifestations is Sothis, which means pregnant. In a literal way, she gives birth to Horus, um, who is the resurrected Osiris. But 
by bringing Osiris to life twice, in a metaphoric way, she becomes his mother too, as she's frequently referred to in Egyptian texts. The usual form of this myth is that of a mother and son. We, we've talked about this before. The usual vegetation myth is that of a mother and the son who grows up to become her consort. She gives birth to him, she mates with him when he matures, and then she regathers him to herself when he dies. As we, as we described it in the last lecture, she is always the Zoe, he is always the Bios. Another interesting little detail of this, in, in many of these myths, the sun consort is killed by a boar. I mean, this happens in many of these vegetation myths, the, the Semitic Tammuz or Adonis or Attis. There are a lot of these consort figures who are killed by a boar. And the boar actually, interestingly, shows up in this story obliquely since Seth is out hunting boars when he discovers the hidden body of Osiris. Um, he was also hunting, so Plutarch says, on the night of the full moon, and the reason why he cuts the body into 14 pieces is that those 14 pieces correspond to the 14 days between the full moon and the dark moon. Um, Isis, according to the story, reassembles the body at the crescent moon, and all of this again suggests these deep connections between the goddess and the lunar cycle, that one we talked about in our last lecture. And typically, uh, Isis here again is the complete and recurring cycle, the Zoe, while her consort is the Bios, who was born, who lives, and who dies, represented here by Osiris and Horus as aspects of that same figure. In other uh, Egyptian iconography, this becomes even clearer. One of the hieroglyphs in Isis' name is that of the throne, which she wears on her headdress. By extension, she becomes the throne on which the pharaoh sat, and the pharaoh himself called himself frequently the son of Isis. Sitting on the throne meant sitting on Isis's lap, as a child does on its mother's, and in temples there are wall paintings of the pharaoh nursing at Isis's breast. As, as, as Horus, every pharaoh is Isis' son, and as Osiris, he's her grown-up consort. Dead, he's reabsorbed back into the goddess herself, back into the underground womb, cradled on his way by Isis and Nephthys, and then Isis becomes the mother of the next pharaoh, the next Horus. So the myth shows the goddess in all of her aspects, as wife, as mother, as crone, creating life out of herself and then taking it back. The idea of the king as the consort of the goddess is also a familiar one to us. In the last lecture, we saw that every king of Uruk was an incarnation of Demutsi, each year marrying Anana to assure, ensure fertility. In lecture 12, we saw that when the Norse fertility god Freyr dies, he lives on in a succession of kings, each of whom becomes a consort of Freyr's sister Freya in order to make crops grow. In lecture 13, in the African myth of Muetsi and his two wives, Masasi and Morongo, Muetsi is killed by his children when the crops fail and a new mambo is chosen in his place. These are the kinds of myths that lie behind the ritual in Fraser's The Golden Bough, and they remind us that in the, the goddess in all of them is the eternal cycle of birth, life, procreation, and death, which forever repeats itself, while the male consort is the transient creature who lives through one of those cycles and then dies back into his mother. It's the story of Horus and Osiris again. So Isis and Osiris illustrate some of the same points about the goddess that we've been making in the last two lectures. Even some of the details are surprisingly parallel. The mother aspect of Isis was emphasized in countless paintings and statues of her and pictures of her rousing her dead husband back to life or pictures of her nursing the infant Horus. The latter, in fact, may have contributed a great deal to the countless depictions of the Madonna and child centuries later. Isis, as we said, began as an Egyptian goddess, but she became famous on the world stage. Um, she went places and saw many things in her time. When Alexander the Great conquered Egypt in the fourth century BCE, Egypt became part of the Greek world, and Greek rulers encouraged the blending of Greek and, and Egyptian religions. In this new syncretistic religion, Isis became the wife of Serapis, the bull god, and Greek traders carried this pair back to Greece, where Isis, searching for Osiris, got blended with Demeter, searching for Persephone. Plutarch sees correspondences between Osiris and Dionysus, who was already involved in the Eleusian Sucinian mysteries of Demeter, and others found links between Osiris and Hades, or Pluto, the Greek 
and Roman gods of the underworld. Athens became a really important center of Egyptian mystery religion. Isis had her own temple on the south of the Acropolis, and another one at Delos taking her place beside the classical Greek deities. She made it to Rome as early as 80 BCE, but she really found a home there after 43 BCE when a permanent temple was erected to her. By the time of the introduction of Christianity into Europe, Isis cults were all over the Roman world. She had gone from being a great goddess to fertility goddess to deity of a mystery cult, and she had traveled a long way. Bering and Cashford say that she lasted so long that the evolution of consciousness can be seen reflected in the different ways she was conceived and honored. Next time, we will finish our unit on the goddess by looking at her eclipse, triggered by invasions of her lands by people who brought with them sky gods, whose challenge forever changed mythology and religion. That will be next time.